Welcome to Living Lit, where conversations spark inspiration to live in truth. Journey together with us to explore what it means to live a liturgical life and walk in the truth of our faith. Let's instill a culture in our hearts, homes, families, and world, living a life cooperating with and walking alongside our Lord. I'm Robin Brueggemann. Let's be a light, share the light, shine the light, and live lit. Well, welcome friends. Um, it's great to be back again. Um, we have been on vacation for a few weeks. Um, Casey, our great behind the scenes producer was on vacation and I was on vacation spending time with family and we hope that you've been able to enjoy time with your family. Um, the summer is we're recording right now too. So quite often when we hear the word church, we think of the church building, right? It could be like your parish comes to mind. Um, or maybe you think of the church building as, you know, you're driving by, um, you know, through the city or wherever and you see church buildings. Or you might think of when you hear the word church, the people, um, the body of Christ, the church. But have you ever thought about your family and your home being its own little church? So on today's episode, we have the privilege of having Father Tom Hartman with us. And he is going to talk with us about the domestic church, and he has a very unique perspective that he um, gets to add, which is very unique for a priest to get to add on this topic. Father Tom Hartman is from the Our Lady of Victory Pastorate, mm -hmm. and that includes St. Michael's in Sioux Falls and St. George in Hartford, and then he also does prison ministry here within the city of Sioux Falls as well. So Father Tom, thank you so much for um, coming into the studio today to talk about the domestic church. So will you share a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah, like as you said, you know, I'm uh, a parishioner of, I, I'm uh, the pastor at St. Michael's in yeah. St. George and our, our Lady of Victory. Uh, but what's uh, uh, kind of beautiful about coming to St. Michael's, I was the associate there for two years and my mm -hmm. first two years of priesthood with with Father Terry Weber, and my former life was was that of a grocer, right? I was a grocer for 41 years. I ran and owned the family grocery store with some brothers. And so anyways, when I got to St. Michael's, I come to find out that St. Michael is the patron of grocers. <gasps> no way, right? I've not heard that. Right, and <laughs> so anyways, I said I have no idea how he got to be the patron of grocers, but maybe that was just providential for me yeah. that I would end up at, uh, at St. Michael's. St. Michael's Parish, but oh, that's yeah, funny. otherwise I, I, <laughs> I, I did grow up in, in Millbank, South Dakota. And so anyways, and was able to be in that uh, grocery business for, for many years. So I went from distributing to bread to now giving the bread. Oh, life, I love which is, it. Which is beautiful. That is yeah. beautiful. So you have such a unique um, vocation story because, well, all, all vocation stories into any like priesthood, religious life, all of us in our vocations, even as husband and wife, um, single people, whatever, we all have a story. They're all unique and great. Yours is very, um, um, you don't hear of a priest in your situation very often. So I have to tell you a funny story is, um, so St. Michael's has kind of like what's called the, like the last chance mass, right? right? Absolutely. On, right. So if you're in the city of Sioux Falls, St. Michael's has the last mass on Sunday night. So quite often, you know, if you've been traveling and you couldn't hit mass wherever you're traveling, you can get it, you know, was it seven o'clock, is it? On Sunday six night or six, six o'clock yeah. as of now um, on Sunday nights. And so we did that. We were out of town one time and you were there and I had not seen you, been exposed to you, met you, anything. And you had just come back from visiting like your daughter or on a trip or I don't know what it was. And so we're sitting there and I had most of my kids with me in mass. And you said something about, I, I'm just getting back from visiting my daughter. And we all went, did he say daughter? And we're like going up until the pew and going, I think he said daughter. And I'm like, no, we must have heard him wrong. And so we're like, no. And then you said something again about your being with your family. And we were like, what? So that is what makes you so unique and what is going to be um, just so great to have you talk on the topic of domestic church because you're a dad. Yeah. So will you share quick a little bit about that? Because it's so rare that you yeah. hear that. It's pretty unique. Um, the average person isn't probably going to meet a priest that has a family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most people, whether we have, we have non-Catholics and Catholics, which, you know, in our listening family, and um, people are going to go, wait a second, I didn't know priests could have children. 
Mm-hmm. So will you tell us about your family? Yeah, yeah. So in the midst of life, I was married, you know, mm-hmm. married for uh, five years. You know, I did have to suffer through a, a divorce, mm-hmm. which is always, mm-hmm. always painful. But but in the midst of that, I received these two great blessings, right? Mm-hmm. Isaiah, uh, my son, he is now out in Colorado as a firefighter. And uh, he has two little ones, Camp and Quincy, and then his wife, mm-hmm. Megan. So I have a couple of grandkids out in Colorado. I still say it's a little too far. I wish they'd get closer, <laughs> you know. But uh, otherwise, I also have my daughter, Natasha, and then she lives in Millbank with her husband, Christian. He's a farmer. She's a teacher there. Uh, and they have four little ones, you know, oh, trying wow. to live the domestic church, right? Yeah. So she has a, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and then uh, the two twin, oh, twin. Gir- twin girls came oh. along the way here. So. So when they were born, it was uh, four under the age of three. Wow. And so anyway, so. What an awesome blessing. Uh, yeah, it is an awesome blessing. So on Mondays, generally for my day of repose or rest, it's not usually very restful. Because <laughs> I go home and I play with those. You're being those, grandpa on yeah, that day. Yeah, I'm being day. grandpa that on those days. That is awesome. Yeah. So yeah, so anyways, but in that time of having gone through the divorce and just uh, um, really the, the Lord kind of just giving me a check in life, you know, and things like that. And just really having come back into my faith and trusting the Lord in the midst of um, uh, maybe these knots that I tied in my life, right, mm-hmm. that that weren't healthy, is that uh, just bringing them to the Lord and as he began to untie them, and especially, I always say, through the gift of the uh, annulment, mm-hmm. you know, that uh, I went through the annulment process and uh, that my marriage was declared nulled and uh, that was opened me up to being able to enter into a vocation again, you know, whether that's marriage or in this case, uh, priesthood. Priesthood. And so that that call just kind of was was there, but yet uh, I still had these little children, right? Because they were only Mm -hmm. five and four at the time. And so anyways, uh, uh, basically I knew that they had to uh, be raised and Mm kind of be there. And when they were both about to enter college, I approached Bishop Swain uh, thinking that it was time. And Bishop Swain said, why don't you wait two more years and come back? He really wanted to make sure that these kids were on the right trajectory of life, that they knew where they were going, that they were secure. And so there was a lot of wisdom in, wow. in Bishop Swain. For sure. So two years later then, I uh, asked again, and he accepted me into seminary. So, so really, I've been ordained for six years. I was wow. ordained in 2017. And wow. uh, so two years at St. Michael's. Then I went to... Uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton and St. Joseph and Turton. Okay. Uh, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, as we know, was uh, a mother yes. and, a sis- and a religious sister, yeah, right? So uh, very a similar superior. story So there, yeah, huh? so kind of a, a later vocation kind yeah. of call too. And so yeah. so beautiful how God's providence, and as we talk about the domestic churches, his providence in the liturgy and in our communion of saints, and yeah. all those things are just kind of very providential and oftentimes uncanny so yeah but for yeah. now i'm back at saint michael's that patron saint of grocers and, you know, <laughs> i love it and so so that it's a privilege so yeah it's a privilege to have life. him as my as my patron and my uh the uh, the patron of our parish at saint michael's but yeah. but we also have saint george you know yeah. and, uh i was doing youth camps for diocese of new Ulm. i had a religious yeah. sister who was asking me and the two great saints she wanted to give to the boys were St. Michael and St. George. So even had a Perfect. connection to St. George in my life. So it's, it's a blessing to yeah. be able to be there too. Oh, so, awesome. Yeah, yeah, God is really just putting all these little kind of confirmations. Right, these confirmations, in your path. absolutely. You're like, oh, hey, you're right where I planned for you to be. And yeah. what a beautiful vocation yeah. story. And um, wow, I love that you were able to um, really remain present in your, vo- your dad role as you know, as dad to your kids, like, and, and in um, Bishop's wisdom to make sure you were, you know, there just a little bit longer with them and stuff, but then mm-hmm. in God's time, right? Yeah, now yeah. you yeah. Um, are a father to mm-hmm. so many. So that is right. so, so beautiful. Wow, yeah. I'm so thankful yeah. for your call to vocation. And I think it's also such a great witness to um, just, the, just the variety of um, situations that the Lord calls people mm-hmm. through and um, and then into life, right. you know, in his timing. Right. And I imagine that your life history has just really 
been a blessing to so many of your parishioners and those that you minister to because you have lived through, you know, like you've been married, you've gone through divorce, like the annulment, mm -hmm. you know, process, and yeah. then having children and your grandpa. Yeah, so, and the grandpa, right. So, so many things that I'm sure are just a total gift yeah. in your priestly ministry. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. So we are going to talk on the domestic church, which then you know well because you've lived mm -hmm. it. And then you are a priest that gets to encourage others to build their domestic church. So that's going to be our topic today. Would you open us in a prayer then before we dig into that? Right. I would love to. So, And this prayer is uh, really the, the prayer of St. Augustine okay. to the Holy Spirit. Uh, but at the end of the prayer, the second half is just kind of that prayer that just came to, was coming to me through my seminary days. And so I call it my, my priestly prayer, and I'll okay. adapt it to all of us living our vocations. Wonderful. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Breathe in us, Holy Spirit, that our thoughts may be holy. Act in us, Holy Spirit, that our work may be holy. Draw our hearts, Holy Spirit, that we love what is holy. Strengthen us to defend what is holy. Guard us that we may always be holy. Create in us priestly hearts, victim hearts, hearts that will love you steadfastly, zealously, and with deep humility, that we may praise you with joyful hearts in our vocations. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. So beautiful, and that really can be adapted to any of us. Right. Like, I just right. love that. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. Um, I'll try and remember to connect that into our show notes, too. So if people want to print that off, that the, could be hung up in their domestic church. It can be something um, anybody can pray, right. no matter where yeah. you're at in your stage of life. Um, yeah. That's just a great prayer to, you know, pray yeah. each day or have it hanging up. So thank you so much for yeah. that. So we're going to jump into, you know, what is the domestic church? What does it look like? What can it look like? Why is it important that we even work on the growing mm -hmm. of our domestic church. As I was driving in this morning, I was listening to Real Presence Radio, which I absolutely love. And um, I think they might have had, so as we're recording this, the National Eucharistic Congress is going on, mm -hmm. which is an, an amazing, huge event right, yeah. to, that celebrates our faith and Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. And so I, I'm not sure if they had maybe someone live from there, but this priest said, um, he was speaking of like the church in general, um, and he said, you know, the church is communion with God and unity with each other. And that I thought was so beautiful and fitting for our topic too, because yes, that is the church, um, our church, the Catholic church. It is the church when we're going to church for mass, to worship, um, to, you know, um, enter into, you know, the Eucharist, um, all of that. But it is so our domestic church. It is our family. So if we can think of our family, our home church, we um, we want to be in communion with God. We mm -hmm. want to be living um, individually. So if, if we're single or we're um, empty nesters or we're whatever, mm -hmm. we want to live in communion with God, not yeah. just at church, in the yeah. church building, not just at mass. We want to bring that into our life. We want to live that way. Mm -hmm. We want to live in communion with God and then in unity with each other. And I thought, wow, like as I heard that, as I was driving into the city today, I just thought, wow, that's just a really beautiful mm -hmm. way to think of how we have that, yes, in the church building and the family of God at Mass, but that's really what we want to have in our homes with right. our families. And even if all of our kiddos are out of the home or we don't even have kids, we want to be in communion with God and unity with each other. So mm -hmm. will you tell me why, and our listeners, um, why do you have this passion for the domestic church? So how, I mean, as a dad, of course, but tell me about your passion for that. Yeah, you know, actually, though, I, I think it, um, it's, it's beautiful how it started as a dad, you know, and actually going through a divorce and uh, having um, uh, the kids being raised in some ways in two different ways, you know, mm -hmm. there's probably a, a little bit of the, the clashing that could have went on and just trying to, uh, the Lord convicted me that, you know, you have to live it in such a way that it becomes attractive mm -hmm. to your kids, you know, and that when they're with you, live it, live it there, and eventually they have to, to choose this, choose this for themselves. Uh, but then as a priest, uh, there are a couple things that opened my eyes even deeper as a, you know, as a dad. And one of them was that I was uh, celebrating a baptism for a little baby, and it came time after the all the baptism um, 
the, the anointing, the baptism, the anointing, the white garment. And then we sign the senses, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we sign the senses, we, we say to that little baby, may the Lord open your ears that you may hear his word, right? And then may he open your lips that you may speak his praise. And when I, when I was doing this prayer that day as a priest, uh, I was thinking about when my kids were at their littlest ages. Mm -hmm. And anyways, Isaiah was talking, you know, he was that two-ish range and they were 14 months apart. And Natasha was right at about that 11 month mark, 12 month. And she was getting to that point where she could actually, she spoke at a young age and she could say a few names. And so anyways, when I look back at that moment, um, I remember every night I would go and I would pray with Isaiah. And every night we would pray the angel of God. And they were in the same room in cribs across from each other, <laughs> right? And so anyway, so as, we're, uh, as I'm praying that angel of God and he would go through his list, right? Mm -hmm. God bless mom and dad. And he would do his whole list of people mm -hmm. who he wanted to bless. And so anyways, and that was just kind of our, our little tradition of praying at night. And uh, then one night as I was there, I'm like, well, this is so silly. Why am I just praying with this one, you know, and not praying with the baby, <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, the catechism even says, you know, you want to pray with your child from the earliest ages. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so I went over to that little one who has been observing for 11 months this routine that's been taking place. And I took her little hand and I made the sign of the cross and I prayed the angel of God. And as soon as I got done praying the angel of God, she says, Mommy, Daddy, Warren, Susan, Grandma, Grandpa. She oh, said, my goodness. She said the names that she knew. She'd right? been listening and all, those, she, all yeah. that time. And, and then as I look back at that as a priest, I'm like, well, why should I be surprised? We asked the Lord to open her ears, yeah. right? That she would hear his word, you know? So there she is listening wow. that whole time. And then I think about that beautiful prayer of praise. You know, how much it delighted my heart as a father, right? To all of yeah. a sudden hear this little one say, Grandma, Grandpa Warren, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa Warren, Susan, right? Yeah. You know, and so, so anyways, there is that aspect that there is this praise being given from that earliest age. and. I think this is, this is what we see when we're raising our kids in the realm of the domestic church in home mm -hmm. from the youngest ages that they really have a great capacity for God. They do. Yeah. They do. So, oh, that's a beautiful story yeah. and connection. Yeah. What a gift that you were able to exp you know, tie these two worlds together right. and with, through God. So, oh my gosh, that's just amazing. Yeah. So let's break down um, a moment before we go too much further of what, what is a domestic church? So we right. think of domestic, you know, um, we like, we all have something that comes to mind when we hear church, mm -hmm. but domas domestic, do you want to break that down a little bit or your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, really, you know, when it comes down to domestic church, I think the uh, best way just to say that domestic is the home church, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how you're living uh, church, how you're living, as you said earlier, this this communion of of persons of the family, uh, mom, dad, child, in relationship with the Lord. You know, you had this. You were talking, and you kind of had this this expansion. You know that uh, that we that you kind of indicated towards is that each of us has to have that communion, that union with God. You know, which is uh, so we each. Wherever we're at, whether we're single, married, priest, we have to have that that uh, personal that relationship with God that we uh, we continue to nurture through prayer. Mm -hmm. But then, when you add another person into that, that all of a sudden you're a couple. You know, as a couple, you have to say, okay, we each have to definitely have our own relationship with God. But now we have to come together and live this together. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when those two are living it together, all of a sudden we find that there's a third or a fourth one. And so we have this responsibility to continue to expand and live this well as an individual, as a couple, and as a family, and to bring this communion of persons together to uh, uh, worship God in the home. Yeah. Um, probably a, a beautiful image that comes to my mind is also, um, I have gone through many homes and blessed them. You know, people ask me to come and bless their homes. And there is a beautiful line in the book of blessings that it says, 
May your home diffuse far and wide the goodness of Christ. Oh, that's awesome. You know, yeah. And so when I think about that word diffuse, the image that comes to mind is those Glade plug-in fresh, oh, fresh you know, yeah, yeah. you used to plug them in and then you had the little bottle inside yes. and every few minutes or whatever it was, all of a sudden you'd hear, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah. so anyways, and that image is beautiful though, when you think, okay, may your house just diffuse far and wide the goodness of Christ that mm -hmm. people come into their house and they'll be like, oh, there's a goodness here. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that that goodness comes from living uh, the domestic church well mm -hmm. in the home. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. So um, I think, you know, some people might be here. There, we, there's a lot of people that have heard of the domestic church or been exposed to whether reading about it or hearing about it um, in one way that they've, they're already like, okay, I have a domestic church and I want to be intentional about what our domestic church looks like and feels like. But there might be people that are like, oh, okay, now where do I start? What can mm -hmm. I do? How, how, what would you recommend? Let's just, just uh, someone just, just entering in, this is new, they've never heard of this. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What would you recommend? Or well, what are your, what's your wisdom in mm -hmm. these new lenses right. that someone right. all of a sudden is like, wait a second, I'm gonna look at my family now through mm -hmm. these different lenses I have a domestic church, and um, so what would, what's your wisdom yeah. there? And yeah, I have a domestic church, and God trusts me so much that I've been given these little souls, right, mm -hmm. to, to form in love of Him and neighbor, you know, that, uh, so, so yeah, so this great entrustment that the Lord gives you is number one, is that uh, thank the Lord, you know, mm -hmm. for the gift that you've been given, you know, that He trusts you so much that He, he gave you these little souls to, to nurture. You know, again, uh, where I, it, I think there's these simple ways that we want to be consistent with, you know, that are easy to live it. Do we pray together at the meal table? Mm -hmm. You know, such a beautiful, simple little act that we do. And then, um, you know, uh, the, the consistency that, yes, I am going to Mass every Sunday with my family and introducing them to their uh, in some ways, their bigger family, right? right? This, right. Yeah. this supernatural family of God. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, if you can live the liturgy during the week, we have this great communion of saints, right? That we mm -hmm. celebrate saints. But I think, you know, doing those meal prayers, doing that uh, morning prayer, mm -hmm. you know, and when I was a child, um, mom and dad, one day all of a sudden just said, we're getting up every morning and we're doing morning prayer together. And I was a kindergartner and so anyways, I remember there was a change in our home. And so in that change, they started to do uh, this morning prayer. It was called a family prayer card. And they would read from the family prayer card and then everybody would go around and say who they wanted to pray for or if there were some awesome. prayers. And then I just remember my dad would always say at the end, thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you've, you've given us. Uh, but so uh, maybe parents are like, I don't know what to do, but that was such a simple little act that we all got up before school. And I can tell you that with, I grew up in a family of 12, there were older siblings that were sleeping on the couch. But you know, <laughs> of course I would never slept during that. You know? just, so, anyway. This is real family but life. This is this real is family real life, right? Church. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not always perfect and pretty right. and things like that. But at the same time, uh, it was such an Im impression on me. But I remember as a kindergartner, I'd always ask mom, and dad, well, when is it my turn to read the prayer card? Because we'd take turns. And anyways, they would always say, well, when you're in first grade and you learn to oh. read, you know, so because so back then you didn't learn it as early yeah, as you do yeah. now. Well, anyways, I do remember my first day of sitting on my mom's lap uh -huh. and reading that prayer card. And I think that's also was one of those moments of uh, the domestic church is also called to help the child discover their vocation. Mm. And I, there's something beautiful about reading that prayer card that I think also is I look back at it and say, oh, there was this desire mm. for prayer in my heart and to be able to do that. And so there's uh, not only that call as, fa as dad, but mm -hmm. as, as a priest and father today. So morning prayer. You know, that night prayer is just so important too before they go to bed. Well, and you, you know. gave us, you showed us how even as right. an infant, as an infant, your daughter, yeah, was I mean, that's powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so night prayer. So night prayer. Too. So I think these are little ways that as as we're starting and say, okay, 
what can I do that's not just uh, like if you haven't been there and been doing anything, yeah. this isn't like overwhelming, right? right we right. can make yeah. that like pretty baby simple. Steps yeah, baby steps. Yeah, baby steps. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But but it is essential with that. Uh, uh, you know, morning prayer, night prayer. I think, and those meal prayers are just an easy routine for mm -hmm. a family to start a habit. Uh, but yeah. that essential habit of connecting them to the mass for on sure. Sundays for sure. We know yeah. it's our obligation, but. Uh, when my kids would say, do we have to go to church? I'd say, no, we don't have to. We get to we go get to, to church, right? You know. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. so it is this uh, teaching them of the privilege of, mm -hmm. of going to the Mass. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I would really encourage people to do that is important, and you can even start this, uh, uh, this with um, your children, even in the midst of the, um, these little things that I've already encouraged, is read from a Bible. Mm. We got to be connected to the scriptures. Um, you know, I was thinking about, and I didn't do, as a dad, I didn't do a, a great job with that. You know, I can look mm. back and say, uh, I did, but I didn't, I wasn't consistent. And I think that there's an importance with consistency in that. Um, I would look back at that and I remember my favorite book as uh, reading to my kids is uh, one was Meanwhile Back at the Ranch, uh, <laughs> and the other one was, it was called, and a lot of you have heard of it, Dr. Seuss, Dr. Seuss's Bee Book. Mm. Now, if I, if I wanted, I could actually recite that I whole book <laughs> to you today, right? <laughs> and so anyways, as a priest, I'm looking back at that, I'm saying, you know, I, I read those books to my kids so many times that I don't even need the book mm. today. And so I filled them with Dr. Seuss, you know, that I think in every night reading, it's so simple to be able to get a children's Bible mm -hmm. at the young age, right? Just yeah. to introduce them to those preschool Bibles. And then yeah. maybe to expand that at first and second grade to have a few more words. But, you know, by mm -hmm. third or fourth grade, you know, they can have that, that whole Bible and to be able yeah. to, to read from there. But could you incorporate the gospel of the day, you know, mm -hmm. of mass? at your dinner table, you know, right. these are ways, but, but it is really important to, uh, to read the word of God. It is for sure. Yeah. And, um, I, that I'm so glad you brought that into this. Um, because, you know, everything in our faith is based on scripture. It, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. just, um, you know, scripture and tradition, but it's such a part of our faith mm -hmm. and our life and it's our history. It's our salvation mm -hmm. history. And what I love about you, you know, talking about actually reading from the Bible is I think, um, cause not everybody's, I mean, interestingly enough, making the connection that when you're going to mass and you hear, you know, the first reading, the second mm -hmm. reading the gospel, this is out of the Bible, you right. know, cause we're listening and, um, you know, and they're saying the book, it's right. You know, we're reading mm -hmm. from, you know, this book or the Holy yeah. gospel, according to Matthew, whatever. But I think there is some just incredible value of having an actual physical Bible, because we can all pull up Bible verses and scriptures and whatever, right. and on apps on our phone. Yeah. But I think there's something very powerful about, especially in today's world, mm -hmm. where everything is on a screen, mm -hmm. to have a, even a, that physical Bible to show mm -hmm. them, this is the word of God. Yeah. This is the word of God that we hear proclaimed at mass. Mm -hmm. This is our faith, this is our life. And so I'm so yeah. glad you brought that into that. And, yeah. and such a great, um, just, I mean, I, as you were saying these books, I mean, I've read those books to my kiddos too, and I'm thinking of all the other books. And so true. It's like, yeah, if we just think of how that would yeah. be replaying, if we had Bible stories, that's what's replaying. Right. And they can, and that would serve them so well. Right. When they yeah. leave our homes, when they can fall back on that yeah. word of God. Yeah. That and, will, yeah. And to progress at the appropriate ages. You know, yeah. it doesn't have to be a lot when they're little, but yeah. they're getting to learn those names with those little preschool Bibles, yeah. you know, things like yeah. that. But, you know, there was a, a moment in just in the importance of reading the scriptures uh, that as I was looking at that, uh, I was um, talking to a group of youth and just saying, you know, how many of you can tell me uh, what your mom and dad are saying without them being there? You know, so anyways, if I said to the little, to the elementary school kids, I'd say, what would your mom, if your mom's not here, but what would she be telling you in the morning if she weren't there? You know, 
brush your teeth, comb your mm -hmm. hair, this, that. And, and I, I did this with a group at the Abbey of the Hills where I spoke on the domestic church. And I went around to all these adults and I said, what is the words that you can still hear your parents say mm -hmm. to you? Right. And anyways, <laughs> mine would be, Good my mom, <laughs> yeah, my mom's would be offer it up. Oh, know? wow. She always said offer it up. And so I just grew up knowing that I can still hear my mom when all of a sudden I, you know, I stub my toe or whatever it is. Mm. My mom's voice comes to me and it's like offered up. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so when we're in a relationship with somebody, you know, their words stay with us. Mm. And so when we're in a relationship with the word of God and we're hearing his word on a regular basis, then when we're not actually physically in that word and something comes up in life, we can call on that word because mm. we've been hearing his voice every day yeah. speak to us. Yeah. And so, so it's so important to be in scriptures, to be able to, uh, to be able to stay in connection to that word, to hear yeah. it when it's not present with us as we're reading it at mass or in our homes. And yeah, so I'm so glad you brought that up um, because it's something anybody can do. Anybody, you know, um, any stage of life, if you have, if you're not already incorporating that, you can start today. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love how, um, you know, you even talked about how like your family growing up started praying, you know, that your parents made this decision. We are going to start doing this as a family mm -hmm. because I think so often we can get hung up in a, oh, where do I start? Like, I, I guess, you know, I've got kids out of the home. I've still got some, like, can I just start this? Are they going to think we're funny if we all of a sudden just say, kids, we're going to start doing this prayer practice. Right. But you've just showed the power in that where it's like, yeah. no, and at any time a parent can just say, or any of us can just say, you know, what? I'm starting doing this today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to incorporate right. this faith practice. But mm -hmm. that's a beautiful real life example of how your mm -hmm. parents just said, we're going to start doing this right. and look at the difference it made in your family. And right. wow, wow, that's yeah. just so powerful. So that's mm -hmm. such encouragement mm -hmm. for anybody, wherever they're at, to just start living yeah. the faith in new ways um, or reviving things that maybe you once did, you know, in your own life or with your family that you've maybe let slide. Mm -hmm. Bring it back again. Bring it back um, again, yeah. And, and I would say that no one's ever going to regret that. Mm -hmm. I think we could so easily, if we don't, take some steps or follow the prompts that the Holy Spirit and the Lord are putting in our life, we can definitely look back if we don't follow those and with regret and think, oh my goodness, why didn't I start doing that with the kids mm -hmm. or with the family? But no one's ever going to regret incorporating these little practices right. into their faith life. They will never regret that and yeah. um, goodness will come from that. Yeah. So I'm so glad you brought that up of your family doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other things that, um, so you presented at the Abbey about the domestic church, the Abbey of the Hills, which is one of the retreat centers mm -hmm. in the Sioux Falls diocese. And you were asked to present on the domestic mm -hmm. church. So as we've been talking, I know that was a little far back and, um, as a priest, you have a very active life of all kinds of right. topics, but there, as we're visiting, are there anything are things that have come up as we're talking now that you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I want to talk about that a little bit on the domestic church. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, we, you know, as we go through uh, the liturgy lived through the year is it, it is us walking in the life of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we're walking through his life throughout the whole year. So to, to be able to allow the church to help you to walk through that mm -hmm. uh, is so important. You know, so the beginning of the year, we start with Advent, you know, and we can celebrate Advent in the home through these traditions mm -hmm. that we have that you uh, can have that Advent wreath out and to be able to uh, use that Advent wreath at your dinner table to increase that anticipation of the mm -hmm. kids. They're like, oh, we're getting closer, right? Yeah. And yeah. so to be, able to, to be able to use these traditions of our faith that help us to uh, be able to uh, become more aware of where we're at in this life of of Christ, you know, yeah, maybe you had yeah. your own uh, family traditions, but we always had an an Advent wreath, you know. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, God rest his soul, uh, Father Dana Christensen. Whenever oh, I, yeah. whenever I think of um, Advent, I can't and Christmas, I can't help but think of him. You know, he was he was a, a little boy in his home that he had a he had a draw to the liturgical life of the church, mm -hmm. you know. And anyways, like a lot of families, he would. Uh, take the the family would take the lights down after 
uh, New Year's, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, Christmas still went till the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. Uh, when he learned that, he took the lights and put them in his room until oh, awesome. the Feast of the Baptism. That's and, so and fun. And this was a little boy, right? Yeah, that yeah. He was, he was learning to live, live the liturgy, right? And yeah. he was leading as an example uh, for his family. But yeah, those are those things that we can do to live the liturgy. What are those things that we do? How do we celebrate uh, uh, the Christmas season? Mm -hmm. You know, do we celebrate Epiphany and the the wise men and mm -hmm. uh, do we you know in our parish at St. Michael's we always do the the blessing of chalk at that time yeah, yep. and so For that people epiphany. can uh, bless have the annual blessing of their homes and they can yes. certainly do it themselves yeah. but I, I thought wow wouldn't it be and that's a, always my proposal every year at St. Michael's is wouldn't it be awesome if the 2,000 of us here this weekend would have our doorpost marked with the house of blessing and mm -hmm. all of a sudden people are asking what are all these marks yeah above they the, door, above you know, the doorways above on the, the chalk, doorways, right? the numbers and the letters and if if catholics would just do that in their mm -hmm. home every year and us as a diocese you know that you have yes, thousands that. of people with that above their door people are going to be asking yeah that and would be totally a, living lit living it, liturgical yeah, <laughs> right and and it but it's one of those things that this is just a simple way when people say well you know, what is that above your door? You know, it gives you a chance to be actually yeah. do your mission of being the domestic church and evangelization. Yeah. Just what Bishop de Groot wants us to do, yeah. right? What are these simple ways we can do that? But yeah, how do you live Christmas well then? And then, of course, um, uh, Lent, you know, these Lenten practices uh, that we do and to be able to uh, incorporate our kids into them. But I think the liturgy provides us uh, with a beautiful structure of walking through the life of Christ. And so don't forget about embracing these traditions throughout the year. Maybe you have some as a mother that you did through the years yeah, or, yeah. you know, and. You know, I, I think I would just so echo that in that um, the church gives us everything we need. Mm -hmm. It really does. Yeah. And when you understand that and you trust that and you live in that, it is. You, if you follow the life of the church, mm -hmm. the liturgical year, the liturgical life, you are walking in Christ's footsteps and you, it, it just guides you closer to him. Because in our domestic church, in our, in our family life, mm -hmm. our goal is to get to heaven. Yeah. That's, um, that's our only goal, yeah. to get yeah. our, our family and then whoever else we can get right. along right. the way. But you yeah. be focused, super laser focused on getting yeah. your family to heaven. And the church and all of its beauty provides everything we need for that. Mm -hmm. If we will just stay in that communion with the church right. and look to the church, yeah. they're saying, look, we have everything you need. We have yeah. the Eucharist, we have the mass. And if you'll just follow along with the church yeah. here, you're gonna stay on track. I mean, yeah. not saying if you don't, that you're not gonna be, you know, you, you, you can still go to mass and not be super, you know, every single day in right. line with the I mean, yeah. you're gonna be okay. I'm not, I don't wanna scare people, but you're, you're going to live in a lot more fullness of it and mm -hmm. beauty when you're just looking to the church for that guidance. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that just um, is something we really need to bring up and that you brought up with, we start the liturgical year. So the liturgical year we have all year, but it mm -hmm. begins new in Advent. And that's so perfectly timed because that is the beginning of Christ's life, mm -hmm. Christ coming into the world. Yeah which is miraculous, amazing, total gift, but he was born into a family mm -hmm. that God knew. Yeah. You know, he, he, he made that. So all of us can look to, we, we know Jesus lived in a family. He had a domestic church, yeah. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph with God the Father. And that's what we have. So mm -hmm. we have the absolute perfect model to look to yeah. for a domestic church. And I just... I'm so grateful that God did that for us, that he, mm. he gave his son in so many ways for, I mean, for, in every way for us, but that also we can go, oh my goodness, Jesus lived in a family. Right. And then also that I can look to Mary as mm. a mom. I can look to Jesus's mother, who is my mother, all of our mother and dads can look to St. Joseph, yeah. Jesus's earthly father. So God gave us the perfect model mm -hmm. of a family life. And so I just love that, that you brought yeah. it, that, that it, and you know, we see that happen. So when we're living the life of Christ, the whole year, that's what we're seeing. It right. starts as Jesus coming yeah. as a baby and yeah. growing up. Yeah. We're just kind of mirroring that back yeah. and forth. So I just love that. Yeah, yeah. I always hope at the end of the church year 
on that last Sunday when we celebrate Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, that mm -hmm. I can proclaim that uh, more confidently yeah. at the end of that year and that growth has been taking place. I'm like, yes, Jesus Christ is King of the Universe, yeah. right? And, and to be able to be able to proclaim Christ as King, you know, yeah. and, and so that uh, as we're, we're living that in the family, we hope our children can proclaim that at the end of the year more confidently and boldly and yeah, so for sure. so yeah so it's a beautiful culmination at the end absolutely. too absolutely so. but but yet keeping that our focus too that Jesus Christ is king of mm -hmm. our domestic church he's king yeah. of our universe he is king and and mm -hmm. i feel like that's really that's that's sort of the root of this is living in the domestic church mm -hmm. is Christ the king at the center god um the trinity you know yeah. um god the father god the son god the holy spirit and how when that is our center, God, God provides all the grace. So we have the church here to guide mm. us, to help us with all the tools. Yeah. But when we're living in that communion with him, that grace just comes. The grace, yeah. he provides everything for us to have what we need and, and the grace needed to lead our domestic churches and yeah. be there. So praise God, right? That yeah, he just gives us everything we need. Mm. And um Something else I just heard is um, when I was just kind of, you know, studying more on the domestic church, which is just a huge passion of mine and yours like is, um, you know, if we enter into a church, we act in a certain way, we know kind of what's expected, like expected etiquette or behavior within mm -hmm. the church when we enter into, you know, St. Michael's or right. anywhere, the cathedral. Right. That that's another thing to keep in mind, that when our focus shifts to, I have a domestic church, this is, this is our church here mm. at home, that when our focus is on that too, that can also help us because it'd be like, well, would I do this in church? Or like yeah, if we've right. got little kids, well, would you be saying that in church? Would you be slapping yeah, your sister right. in church? Right, <laughs> you know, right. whatever, real life. Sure. Um, and that parent. we can actually, that's something else we can be thinking of, mm. or that can help us. Like, hey, yeah. kids, like, yeah. is that how we act in church? This is our church. Yeah. Let's try not to do that here. This is our church, right. our yeah. home church. And so it, it really is, I think, just um, once you see your eyes are open to the domestic church right. and that you have a mm. domestic church, then you're, it just kind of shifts your focus. Yeah, it shifts you our focus, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I think as parents on the other side, as parents is, um, uh, you know, we see like the Pope's role, Peter Bay entrusted to the keys. You know, what mm -hmm. you bind on earth is bound on earth. What is bound in heaven is bound in heaven. You know, that as a parent, you have the keys to your domestic church, right? right. So, so what are you allowing into your church? Exactly. You know, and so, so yeah, we, we try to instruct our kids in that way, but we always have to keep a look at that as our as us as as parents and mm -hmm. uh, fathers, you know, what am I allowing into into my home? For you sure. know, and I have that uh, authority, you know, to be able mm -hmm. to uh, to keep things bound or loose, right? right. Uh, to not let things in, or we want to welcome this in, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, we are the so, gatekeepers yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for bringing so, that up. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness, I I could talk on this topic for hours, yeah, I could and I'm sure you could too. So, so I think we should get together again and talk more on um, this. But do you have some um, maybe just a real quick final thought? Now let's just say someone's kids are all out of the house, and I don't know if, this, if you've got an answer to this. You know, this is we have a lot of you've given so many great easy ways, mm -hmm. practical ways that people can enter into this domestic church. Um, now for, so I have three kids, grown kids, married now the house, right. but I still have four okay. at home. But let's just say, um, cause I have a lot of friends that are empty nesters mm -hmm. and, or grandmas that will say mm -hmm. to me, what can I do? My kids are out of the house. Or do you have like a mm -hmm. practical tip that you can think of that for people who the kids are out of the home, but you still have a domestic church. I mean, this is still your family. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have a practical tip to bring, um, what's something they could do to bring the family together? Mm. as their family unit mm -hmm. um, here or there. Do you have a thought on that? Um, yeah, well, a lot of thoughts go through my head at this moment, but I was just thinking about um, going back to my mom, you know, that my mom was just convinced that uh, uh, we needed to come together and pray the rosary as a family. So mm. she, she uh, invited anyone who, and now having 12 kids, she has, I think, 48 grandkids and 50 five great, great grandkids, grands. you know, but at this particular time, and she was a, a widow, you know, I suppose she was about 75 years old. So she literally, whoever would be there, there would be enough food 
for everybody. So we'd come and eat a meal and she would make it, I think, sacrifice, right? She, wow. <laughs> she sacrificed to, to do that in the kitchen. Yeah. And then she gathered us together and we prayed um, we prayed the rosary together, awesome. you know, so she still invited those kids and those grandkids. And, you know, uh, again, you're still called to be fruitful, even mm -hmm. as, um, even as that's part of that, even that marriage call that, um, you know, we're called to be fruitful in that natural sense of having children, but mm -hmm. there's also, you know, we're called to be fruitful in many other ways. And yeah. so to know that uh, your mission really has not ended, oh, yeah. you know, for those that are getting, my mom's 94 now and she's in an assisted living. You know, if we live long enough, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, I say you're kind of left with two missions at mm -hmm. the end like that. You're left with prayer and probably suffering. You know, and they, yeah, as my mom taught me so many times, you got to try to offer that up, right? <laughs> that, uh, again, know that as long as you're here, those of you that have kids out of the house, you still have a mission. You know, you have a mission by God. And uh, if you're breathing, there's something we can all do to help the domestic church, but just to continue to help the, uh, the church of God. Mm, thank you. That's so. great. That's great. So just encouragement to people just... Just, just do something. Right. And the invitation. That's yeah. it. Did you have something you want to share with the catechism? Oh, uh, well, yeah. So, okay. yeah, just for anyone, I just, when I was doing my talk at the Abbey, I'm like, I really like to go practical. You know, what is, what is the way in which we can, um, uh, that we can explore the domestic church? Mm -hmm. And I just did it through the lens of the, um, uh, the fourth commandment honor your father and mother. And uh, it has some beautiful sections on the Christian family. It'll, Re reference the domestic church, you know, and so anyways, uh, that kind of is um, my catechism from 2204 and then you can go on and you'll see where the where the section stops, but there are just so many beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, quotes, uh, quotes in there and uh, maybe and we could. this is in the catechism of the Catholic this church. This is in the I'll, catechism I'll of the Catholic church, yeah, but yeah, so I think um, this one here kind of, in some ways, just kind of sums up what we, what we talked about. It says, education in the faith by parents should begin in the child's earliest years, mm. right? Uh, this already happens when family members help one another grow in faith by witness of Christian life in keeping with the gospel. Family catechesis uh, precedes, accompanies, and enriches other forms of instruction in the faith. So, you know, uh, at St. Michael's or in these churches, we want to compliment your mission through religious ed and through, uh, especially if possible, through Bishop O'Gorman schools mm -hmm. in town or your mm -hmm. Catholic schools throughout the diocese. But we're all, we're just complimenting you, right? Right. Yeah, that, that, the parents are the primary yeah. people. So, yeah, so parents have the yeah parents have the mission of teaching their children to pray and to discover their vocation. I you know, so that. I think about back with that family prayer card yep. that mom helped me discover. And then the parish is the Eucharistic community and the heart of the liturgical life of Christian families. It is a privileged place for the catechesis of children and parents. And so mm -hmm. uh, the parish is the Eucharistic community. So, so you definitely that. need that uh, uh, to help you live well, the, the domestic church. So keep, yeah. uh, keep staying faithful to mass and becoming part of that uh, uh, big community that we're all the broader community that we're all called to be part yeah. of the church, right? I love that. That's so. such a great way to end. And that just gave me this picture of, um, as we're wrapping up here, how it does all type, this wrapped up perfectly, all that we've been talking about and how the family fits into the bigger picture. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have our diocese, for example. Well, let's start with the bigger picture real yeah. quick. We have our universal church, the Holy Catholic Universal mm -hmm. Church, you know, um, in you know in rome st peter's whatever and then we can get technical into the archdiocese blah blah blah. Sure. But let's just skip to diocese diocesan yeah. level we are in the sioux falls diocese for example we have our mother church the cathedral here next door um and then we have our parish so mm -hmm. for you you're at st michael's yeah. and st george and then you have your domestic church mm -hmm. so now people can see you can take what you just read from the catechism and kind of visualize where you're fitting then your family your domestic church that's your little church part of a parish part of the diocese part of the whole catholic church yeah, and then beautiful. all of the people the church the body of christ and so i just love that so yeah. um yeah thank you father you have yeah, just been welcome. so wonderful in sharing your life as dad and yeah. as father um wow i, I just can't think so. of 
um, just a better way to introduce people to the domestic church. And, well, thank um, you. Yeah, it's been a blessing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, so do you want to close us in our prayer? Sure, I would love thank to. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, just thank you for this gift of this day. Thank you for this gift of um, being part of the body of Christ, being and having this gift of the church. We thank you, Lord, in particular, just for the gift of being part of this diocese of Sioux Falls in our particular parish. Uh, but we thank you, Lord, for the gift of the domestic church where all of us uh, come from. And so we ask you, Lord, just to give families out there that, that grace to be able to, to enter in and to continue to nurture uh, that domestic church. And so we ask your blessings uh, upon all families and upon all who are listening here today. So may Almighty God bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Go you peace, so everybody. much, yeah. Father. And You're welcome. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, pray yeah, for, us. for us. And um, friends, you, God has already given you everything you need to be working on your domestic church. You've already got it. So go from there and yeah, just go in peace. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Remember to like, subscribe, and share Living Lit and reach out with topics you'd like tackled at livinglit at sfcatholic.org. And be the light, shine the light, share the light, and live lit.